Good evening and a very warm welcome to this UEA London lecture. My name is Fiona Lettis and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of East Anglia. I'm really delighted to see so many alumni, friends and supporters here this evening. So a very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us. Um, and we're also being joined by the live stream as well. So if you're connecting by technology, welcome to you as well. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a small request of you. We'll be sending a brief survey via email to canvas your views on tonight's event and it would help us really very much in planning future lectures if you could give us your feedback and tell us what you think of the evening. If any of you are on Twitter, I'd also encourage you to join the discussion about tonight's talk using the hashtag UEA Live Lecture. For the benefit of those of you who are new to these lectures, the format is that Lynn will speak for around 45 minutes, after which there'll be some time for questions. Finally, we hope that you'll join us for a drink and see some of the research on pollinators taking place at UEA next door in Fivey Hall at the University of Westminster. Um, tonight we'll be leaving not by the foyer but by the fire doors, so, but we'll um, direct you out and, and into the venue next door. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Lynn Dix is a Natural Environment Research Council, NERC for short, which is the logo there, research fellow in the School of Biological Sciences at UEA. Her research interest is in the management of biodiversity and ecosystem services in agriculture, with a particular focus on pollinators and pest regulation. Lynn was awarded her PhD on the structure and function of insect flower visitor communities, communities by the University of Cambridge in 2002, after which she went on to work as a professional science writer and broadcaster for seven years. From 2009, she held the post of NERC Research Fellow in the University of Cambridge Department of Zoology, during which time she managed the Conservation Evidence Project before joining us at UEA in 2016. Lynn is a member of DEFRA's Pollinators Advisory Steering Group and is Bi Biodiversity Advisor to Waitrose and the Cool Farm Alliance. Alongside her work on agricultural biodiversity, Lynn has a passion for backyard ecology and is keen that as many people as possible notice and enjoy the diversity of wild pollinators that busy themselves around us every summer. In her lecture tonight, Lynn will talk about the causes of pollinator decline and the possible impacts of the dwindling number of bees and other pollinators on our food supply, our economy and the world as we know it. She will also describe some of the effects already in place to protect pollinators and set out a wide-reaching plan for supporting pollinators around the world. Please join me now in warmly welcoming Dr Lynn Dix to give tonight's London lecture. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Fiona, for that introduction. What a wonderful venue. I, I, this is such a beautiful room to be in. Um, so thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to start by taking you to the spectacular city of Kuala Lumpur. About two years ago now, 2016, there was a meeting in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which I was lucky enough to go to. Now, this meeting involved over 100 governments who had sent delegations of two, three, or four people to spend a week discussing a couple of reports that this intergovernmental platform had produced. And at this meeting, the first report, which was on pollinators and pollination, was agreed by all these governments. So I'm actually here sitting on the platform for some of this. And it was an astonishing experience for, in, in many ways. In this session, which was actually more than two days long, all of these governments went through a summary report in which we'd assessed all the science, two years of work, 70 plus scientists from all over the world had assessed the science on pollinators and pollination as requested by governments. And then all of the governments sat, sat with us and went through the report line by line to make sure that everyone was happy with the content and that the content was backed up by the science and was traceable to individual scientific pieces of research. But it was really astonishing for me because I started my career in ecology now 20 years ago, working on the structure of flower visiting insect communities and pollination of wild plants in hay meadows. And then pollination was really quite a minor branch of ecology. I never could have imagined that 20 years later I would be sitting in front of the world's governments discussing with them what we need to do to conserve pollinators and pollination. 
So I'm telling you this because now is the time. Following this meeting, a large number of governments around the world have decided to act on pollinators. The world is really listening. So it's a great opportunity for us to identify the best things to do and encourage everybody in the world to do something to support our wild pollinators. Quick outline of my lecture this evening. I'm going to first introduce you to the pollinators of the world, which include bees, and I'll talk mostly about bees. I'm going to take you through what we know about pollinator decline. What is at risk? What do we stand to lose here? And then, perhaps the reason you came this evening, what should be done about it? So first of all, meet the pollinators. Pollination, of course, is the transfer of pollen from male parts of flowers to female parts of other flowers, and it's a really crucial stage in plant reproduction. So it leads to the production of fruit and seeds in many, many wild plants all over the world, and also in many of our important crop plants, which I'll come back to. The animals that do this pollination are very diverse. So where you see slides with this IP Best logo, that's these, these results come from the report, and the slides were put together by the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform. So I need to credit them there. Um, there are many different groups of animals that pollinate. The, the main pollinators you'll often hear are bees, but also there are birds that pollinate, hummingbirds and sunbirds. There are various types of fly, also beetles and wasps, and even mammals and reptiles can pollinate, and there are plants that have particular associations with these different types of pollinator. There are also many, many wild pollinators, which are the ones with a square around here, and there are some, a, a small number of species of pollinators which are managed for, for their pollination services to crops. So thinking about the bees, there are actually 20,000 species of wild bee in the whole world, which is an astonishing number, quite a lot more than there are species of bird. They range in size from very, very small to re <laughs> relatively enormous. I suppose not that large. <laughs> and their diversity is wonderful, but you do have to look quite closely to see it. One of my favourite bees is this species, which is called the Woolcarder bee, or the Latin name Anthidium manicatum, one of the 20,000 in the world that we have in this country. And the reason I love it so much is because the males, which are here, do a particular behaviour, which if you can catch and see it, is, is just lovely to watch. They actually defend a patch of flowers against any other insect from feeding on them. And they do this quite aggressively, and they will fight off and attack any other bee or hoverfly or any, any other insect that flies near. And the reason they do this, we think, is because if you stop insects from visiting flowers, the nectar builds up. So you end up with quite a big reward, which is obviously to present to female bees. And they have these spikes on the end of the abdomen there, which help them with this defense effort. They really are quite vicious. So it's lovely if you can get a chance to see that. Here's another pretty special bee that you can also find in this country, although not so commonly. This is Eucera longicornis. And I thought you might be interested in why on earth it has these really long antennae, much longer than most bees. This is the, the males have these. So I'm going to show you a film I came across a, a year or so ago that's available to see on YouTube, which demonstrates why you see along corners males have such long antennae. I, I had to put a, a little explicit content warning for what's about to come, so apologies. <laughs> Did it play? <laughs> no, it did not play. So this is a pair of Fusira longicornis mating, beautifully filmed by Carla Thompson. And you can see what the antennae are for. They are for stroking. <laughs> I don't think that most bees do this, <laughs> but this species does. So what do we know about pollinator decline? <coughs> the first thing which might surprise you is that, we, that some of the best data we have on a global scale is, is, comes from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and it's reported numbers of managed honeybee colonies in the world, which comes through from all the different countries. These are, these are honeybees, Apis mellifera, so they're kept by beekeepers, and therefore we know how many colonies we have. There are wild honeybees in, in, in Africa, for instance, and in parts of Europe and Asia. These are the colonies that are managed. 
But what you see on this graph is the number of managed colonies reported from 1960 to uh, 20, I think it probably is to 2016. There's not really a pattern of strong decline. That is a global increase of 45% in the number of managed honeybee colonies. It's not an increase in every country. So in some countries, such as North America and some European countries, there are declines in the number of managed honeybee colonies. And this kind of level of decline, if you, the, the, the axes on these graphs are actually um, the percentage change in the number of colonies rather than the number of colonies declining. So this is sort of 60% loss of colonies over this period of time. There have been some very rapid declines in North America, which I think many people have heard about. But in other parts of the world, the number of honeybee colonies is increasing quite fast over the same period of time. So there isn't a big global problem with honeybee decline, which is very surprising for many people. And here you have a map which shows you how the, the changing numbers of managed honeybees um, is distributed across the world. And you can see this is showing you the annual growth in the number of hives from, from minus, three, minus 30 percent a year to increasing 50 percent a year. You can see it's actually only a few places that are showing strong declines and quite a few parts of the world showing increases in the numbers of managed honeybee colonies or hives. So in a sense, that's quite good news for, for honeybees, but there are still problems in some countries and there are very rapid declines in numbers of hives in, in some countries. When it comes to wild insects, we know a lot less. What we have is information showing that there have been declines in the diversity and occurrence of some bees, hoverflies and butterflies but we only have that information from Europe and North America. And we only have it because we have, especially in some Northern European countries, a very long history of amateur naturalists collecting insects, identifying them and recording them. We have these recording societies with data going back more than 100 years where we can map the distribution so we can see the change in distribution over the last 60 or 70 years in some countries or from museum specimens in North America. From that, we can see that there's been a loss of diversity, that many species have shrunk in their range. And you, you don't, if you're a, a wild insect species, your range doesn't shrink unless you've had a very calamitous loss of numbers. So although we're not counting numbers, we can see this. We also have what's called an IUCN red list assessment of, of threat of extinction, just for European bees, and we have one for European butterflies. And in that assessment, 9% of all the European bees were shown to be uh, in one of the threat categories. And where we have population data, so we can see, we know something about the numbers of insects, um, which is only for a small proportion of the species, 37% of European bee species have decreasing numbers. But for the rest of the world, we just, all we can say is we, we don't know. There's a, a lack of data. All of South America, all of Africa, all of Asia, we, we don't really have long-term records enough to be able to make an assessment of what's going on with pollinating insects in these places. I just wanted to show you in the next slide, the, going back to the red list of European bees, I wanted to show how the species fall according to the different threat categories. So this is for about 2,000 bee species which are found in Europe. And um, the least concern, this LC, is, is uh, species which are not declining or showing any signs of, of problem. And all of these categories are critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, nearly threatened. These are the threatened species which are either shrinking or they have a very small range and they're showing signs of decline. But what I really wanted to show you is this great enormous chunk of species, which is 56.7% of all the species, are classed as data deficient. And that means we don't have information enough to even put them in one of these threat categories. We don't know what's going on. And that's for Europe, where we have the best information in the world on, on the status of wild bees. We have some information from the UK. It's actually become a, a, a government-reported indicator on biodiversity for pollinators. And this is an index based on the, the data I was talking about previously, all the, all the distributions of all the species that have been recorded for many years, all bunched together into an index of change in distribution over time, starting in about 1980 and running forward to 20, yeah, 2014 here. And it starts at 100 which is when we first have records, and you can see a, a slight declining trend there over time. And this is reported now every year to the UK government. And it comes from the distributions of a, quite a large number of wild bee species and also hoverfly species, all combined together. But you can also see these graphs here are showing you what the trend looks like or how the species fall into what their trend is over the long term and the short term. And this is percentage of species that are in strong decline or weak decline over the long term. 
And it's, it's, the thing to point out here is that there are a lot more species declining than there are increasing in the long term. So we do have a problem. And it's a loss of diversity. Another thing that's happening, as we lose species from particular places in the country, it's usually the specialist species that are falling out, not the common generalist species. Some species are increasing. And there's a tendency to homogenise the community. So that's another way you can lose biodiversity, as you become more homogenous. And there's one really good piece of evidence for this, which is very clear, and it comes from Sweden. It was a study that was published um, in Sweden where they managed to get some data from, of, of, honey, of bumblebee communities, wild bumblebees visiting red clover fields. And they had data from 1940, and they had another data point here, and then they were able to repeat the surveys and have a look at the bumblebee community in about 20, I think it's possibly 2008. And these are all the different species. Each spe there's a number of bumblebee species here, which you probably won't know what they are. But you can see the change in the community goes from having lots of colours and lots of different species represented over time, it gradually becoming dominated by this species. And these species are dropping down a lot. Now, what these species are, these two species are short-tongued, very generalist species. They're very common in the UK. One of them, Bombus terrestris, is the one that's now managed for pollination of crops. And you can buy colonies. You can, you can ring up a company and buy as many colonies as you want of that. So it's, a, it's become a managed pollinator. They're generalist and they're very common. These species are quite different ecologically. They have much longer tongues, which makes them much better pollinators of a number of flowers, but particularly, in this case, red clover, because red clover flowers have very long petal tubes, corolla tubes, which can't feed, which bees with short tongues can't legitimately pollinate because they can't reach the nectar because their tongues aren't long enough. So what we've lost from the community is the long-tongued bees. And that, that pattern is replicated, but we don't have the data to show it in these terms in the UK. The species of bumblebee that we've lost that have really declined in their distributions are the long-tongued species. We don't exactly know why. There's a strong suggestion it's because we've lost a lot of red clover in the landscape which was also made by these people. Now, over in the US, I can very quickly show you something similar is happening. What we have from the USA is information from collated museum specimens over a much longer period of time. So here you see these graphs are from 18, 1870 or so. And this is just the number of species in the, in the, in the museum collections. And you can just see a gradual decline in the native solitary bees going right up to 2008 to 2011. If you plot how many species there were, you see a loss of native solitary bees, a loss of native bumblebees, which is statistically significant. That's why that line is solid. But interestingly, you have an increase in the number of non-native bees, which is something else that's going on. Part of a global homogenization of biodiversity generally is that species are moving between continents and some species do very well in a new continent. This one that's the example here, which is hated in the US, if you remember, is my favorite bee from the UK, Anthidium manicatum. <laughs> here, it's native, I love it. In the States, it's aggressive, and people don't like it so much because it doesn't belong there, and it's doing very well. So the complexity of biodiversity issues. For some insects, we don't just have distribution data. We actually have been counting the numbers of insects. For instance, we've counted moths. We have a very long record of the large moth numbers based on a light trap survey that was set up by Rothamsted Research in the 60s. So here you see years from 1960s to 2010, and this is a, an index of the actual number of moths. And you can just see an ongoing gradual decline, the scale of which can't go on for very long before you have a really serious loss of moths. This um, works out as two-thirds of the 337 species have declined in that period. Over a third of them have decreased in numbers by, by at least half. So there's a calamitous decline in some moth species. But a third of them have become more abundant. And some have even doubled their numbers. So the, the community is changing. This garden tiger moth in this picture actually declined over this period by 92%. And some of our very common and familiar butterflies, like the small tortoiseshell, we also have surveys of standardized counts of butterflies. And we, so we can see and we know that the small tortoiseshell has had a 73% had had decline in abundance between 76 and 2014. We don't know exactly why, and it's now stabilized, I believe. We have an indicator of what butterfly species of the wider countryside since 76. And we have the same kind of analysis showing again, if you look at the percentage of species that fall into the decline or increase in the longer term and the shorter term, there are more species declining than there are increasing. So this is a, the general picture is 
There are more species declining. There's a homogenization of communities. We have some better information on the status of vertebrate pollinators globally, which I'll just show you very quickly. And these are the, the same pie charts I showed you before from the IUCN, the, the, the conservation red list assessments of extinction threat. I hope you'll notice that for the vertebrates, which is pollinating birds and pollinating bats, the data deficient sector is tiny. <laughs> we have really good information about our vertebrate species in the world. We know most about the birds. But there is still 16.5% of the vertebrate pollinator species are threatened. And there's a pattern of, increase, of moving towards increasing threat in these species. So vertebrate pollinators which pollinate wild plants are also threatened. It's not just about science. Where you have a situation when the science can't tell you the answer because we don't have data from most of the world, there are other sources of knowledge. And I just wanted to briefly mention because the, 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 the big global report, assessment report on pollinators was very good and careful at gathering knowledge from other sources, particularly indigenous and local knowledge. And we found, for instance, that for stingless bees, which are these uh, a great diversity of, of, of social bees that live in the tropics, and some of which are kept by beekeepers in the tropics, there's knowledge from beekeepers in Central and South America reporting declines, quite substantial declines, in the number of wild stingless bees and in stingless beekeeping practices. And I've also been a, involved in a project in India where people... As, talk to farmers and ask them what they had seen happening with their pollinators from a place where we have no data at all on what's really going on with the insect pollinators from a scientific perspective. And we got some very clear messages from these farmers. The, number of, the numbers of some important crop pollinators, they said, had declined sharply in the last 10 to 25 years. They've noticed that. They weren't sure why, but they thought it might be because of pesticide use. And they were talking about their eastern honeybee, the blue-banded bees, Amagilla, and the carpenter bees, which they did recognize. So the farmers in these communities have seen this decline which is a different kind of knowledge, but it, it adds to the, the picture. So what do we stand to lose if we lose pollinators? I'm going to talk first about crop pollination. In the UK, these are probably the main crops which depend on pollination, and that means if they don't have pollinators, you lose some of the yield. How much of the yield you lose is different for different crops. There's, in, for some crops, there's an effect on the quality, particularly for strawberries. If you exclude pollinators, you get misshapen fruit. Some of the seeds will swell, some don't, and so you get a misshapen fruit. So if you, you can calculate the value of the pollination by when you know what proportion of the yield depends on pollinators and how much yield there is for the country and how much the price of that, how much money that generates. And if you do that for the UK, you get a value of 630 to 700 million pounds a year. You can also do it for the whole world based on the, all of the crops and where they're grown. And this is a map that was included in the, the global assessment report, which shows the economic value of pollinators for the whole world. And it adds up to somewhere between 230 and 577 billion dollars, US dollars, per year. That's directly coming from pollinators pollinating crops. And what this map is showing you is the benefits in US dollars per hectare per agricultural area. So it's a really interesting map because it shows you some areas of particularly high pollination value in southern Europe, you can just, if you, look, if you look very carefully, you can see California, where they grow lots of almonds. India and China, massive amounts of fruit being grown. And parts of, of Brazil, for instance, parts of Australia, there's a strong economic dependence of these agricultural industries on pollinators. But even more interestingly, but quite recently now, there's been a lot of different studies looking at what's actually doing the pollination in different crops. And a, a large number of studies was brought together globally to try and estimate where all this value is coming from. And the message from these studies is that on average, roughly half of the crop pollination value is provided by wild insects. It could be more than half, but roughly half, and half is being provided by managed honeybees. So that means that half of all those hundreds of billions of dollars is being provided by insects that are living freely and wild and not looked after by anyone in agricultural landscapes around all these crops which is an interesting situation when we know that where we have data, there are pollinator declines. We don't know what's going on for large parts of the world where there's pollinator value, but we do know that the changes we think are causing the pollinator decline are also going on in those places. So you can infer that this, this kind of declines we've seen in Europe and America are probably going on in other places as well, but we don't have the data to show it. Recently, I was involved in a project that was funded by the Cambridge Conservation Initiative to try and engage 
um, businesses and big agri-food um, supply chains in this issue. And we were just asked the question, so how, how much of a problem is this for food supplies? Are our food supplies really vulnerable to pollinator decline? And we tried to work out what led to vulnerability. It's not just dependence. There are other things as well. So what matters to whether the food supply is vulnerable is what's the status of the wild pollinators? Do we know they're declining or not? How dependent is each crop on, on pollination? But also, can we replace... Remember at the start, I was talking about honeybees being used for pollination. Could we just replace the pollination with managed bees? If it's easy to do that, then actually the supply chain isn't, isn't really vulnerable. The pollinators might be vulnerable, but the, the food isn't. And finally, a, a product is vulnerable if it's only coming from a small number of countries. If it's coming from lots of different places, maybe you can move your supply to somewhere where pollinators are doing okay. So we put all those things together and we came up with a way of assessing different crop products for vulnerability. I'm just going to show you quickly what the, some of our results, which are, are still not published yet. Um, but what popped out of this analysis was that cocoa and Brazil nut are particularly vulnerable. A number of crops that you might quite like, particularly notice coffees here, cashew nut, almond, apple, kiwi, come out as being quite vulnerable to pollinator decline because the pollinators are declining, there's a high dependence, and in many cases you can't just replace the pollination. You can't just have, have a, a variety that doesn't depend, for instance, on pollination. This is a Brazil nut tree, and Brazil nut is, turns out to be highly vulnerable because it can only be pollinated by very large wild bees. The flower is too big for a honeybee to open, so you can't have the pollination, and it's completely dependent on pollination. It's also only produced in four countries in the world, so it's pretty vulnerable to pollinator decline. Perhaps you don't know what this is. This is a cashew nut. And cashew nut is also pollinated by wild bees. The dependence on pollination is less than for Brazil nut, and it's grown mostly in West Africa and India, but it's not quite so constrained, so it comes out as medium to high vulnerability. So this is a kind of way of thinking and engaging companies in, in, in understanding whether they have a, a vulnerability in their supply chains to pollination. But of course, this is all about human food, and it's not just humans that eat, eat food, fruit and seeds in the environment. Lots of other animals also eat fruits, and so are also depending on pollination. And this is where the stability of the whole ecosystem comes in. This is a waxwing. But um, one of the things that my research group at UEA is, is working on is trying to get a handle on how important pollination is for fruit production and seed production in wild ecosystems in, wi in the wider environment. And we started doing this. We published a study early, earlier this year where we just looked at the importance of vertebrate pollinators, so the birds and the bats and the reptiles and, and rodents, to the fruit and seed production of of wild plants, and we put, pull, pull together all the studies from anywhere in the world. It was done by a student at Southampton University that I work with called Fabrizia Ratto, who is at this moment writing up her PhD thesis. I know she is. So here are some of the pollinators we're talking about, hummingbirds, bats, and we were able to come up with a graph like this. Now this is a, called a meta-analysis, so it's bringing together data from lots of different studies, and you see the number of studies here that we've used data from for each of these. What this shows you is the percentage loss of fruit or seed when you exclude the pollinators. So this is a measure of how important the pollination is for the production of fruits and seeds in, in the environment. And if there was no effect of excluding pollinators, it would be zero. This is a loss. So here we have 50% loss of fruits or seeds. These are plants pollinated by bats when you exclude bats. Here the plants pollinated by birds when you exclude the birds, and this is for rodents. On average, across all these studies, there was a loss of 63% of fruits or seeds if you exclude the pollinators. We haven't done this yet for insects. We're working on it, but it's a bigger job because there are many more studies <laughs> for insects. But I just wanted to point this out to you because if you, think of, if you think it through, if you think about all the animals and plants in the wider environment that eat fruit, all those birds eating fruit in the winter, all those, all those seed-eating birds, all those insects that eat, eat seeds and fruit, if you take out almost two-thirds of them, the effect on the wider ecosystem is going to be huge, so it gives you an idea of how important pollinators are. So now I'm on to the final part of the lecture. What on earth are we going to do about all of this? And you might have come across an idea which has been circulating in society recently, an imagining, if you like, and that's, it's fine. We don't need pollinators. We can have drones that do the job. 
This one actually won a design competition last year. It was called Plan B because it was so beautiful looking. There are television programs imagining this idea that you can, and, and actually just a month ago now, last, in March 2018, a Walmart in the US filed a patent which was about producing unmanned aerial vehicles or drone bees to do crop pollination. So it's a very real consideration and I want to show you a video of where the technology has got to. This was published by Science Magazine last year from some Japanese scientists, if it does arrive. Yeah. So sit back for a moment and enjoy the relaxing music. What do you think? <laughs> there might be some other things it can't do apart from making honey. Um, so I'd just like you to, to think about that. I know it's very easy to, to um, make fun of the early stages of a technology, but there are some really important reasons why this is not the answer to pollinator decline. Just imagine for a moment the drones you would need to pollinate all of these flowers. This is oilseed rape, which loses 10% of its yield, roughly, if it doesn't get pollinated. This is buckwheat. There are hundreds of thousands of flowers, they're small. How could you possibly, even if the drones become incredibly good and they're controlled by artificial intelligence and they're all autonomous, how could you possibly provide the service that bees provide in an environment like this? And even if you could, how much would it cost? And what would happen to the drones when they went wrong? And we know that they would, right? <laughs> and they wouldn't just rot away like a dead bee does. So it's almost like imagining a solution to, to, to imagining replacing something in a very complex system with drones is just, it's just it's a crazy idea. I, I wanted to use a, an analogy, which is imagine if you wanted to, if you had a problem with your red blood cells, you were anemic inside your body. Would you think of replacing all the individual red blood cells with tiny robots that absorb oxygen and move it to the right tissues? Of course you wouldn't, because we already have red blood cells. And if you, if you wanted to stop any sort of decline, you would just address the cause of decline rather than replace them with autonomous robots, right? We already have bees. And it's not just bees. It's also hoverflies doing the pollination for some of these crops. So um, I'm going to lay out a hierarchy of plans to respond to pollinator decline now. Plan A is to keep the diverse, abundant communities of wild pollinators that we had here 100 years ago and we still have in some parts of the world just look after them. Plan B, from where we are now, we need to transform the management of landscape, especially agriculture, but also urban areas, to support thriving pollinator communities. If that doesn't work, plan C, we can move to managed pollinators to, to support crop pollination. Honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees can all be managed by people. Plan D, replace with pollinator drones. <laughs> so these two plans, they, they might just about cope with crop pollination, especially plan C, but they will not help wild plants and they will not help pollinators for their own diversity and joy very much. I mean, for human joy. And this plan doesn't help pollinators, plants or farmers very much because it's bound to be extremely costly. So if you're going to solve pollinator decline, you need to have a good idea of why pollinators have declined. And I can sum it up for the UK, I think, with this pair of photographs. Since the early last century, we've moved from a landscape that had an enormous amount of this to a landscape that had a lot of this. We've done a lot of intensification, we've used a lot of chemicals, we've transformed agriculture away from being flower-rich landscapes and we've lost vast amounts of flowers. And bees particularly rely on flowers entirely for their, in their whole life cycle. They're larvae and as adults, they only eat nectar and pollen. 
So this change has been caused by a loss of flowers, loss of habitat, and the use of fertilisers and pesticides. All combined together, probably. There are many different drivers interacting. So when we finished writing the global assessment report that I was involved in as an author, which I talked about at the start, we tried to come up with a single diagram that, that represented the whole pollinator problem. It was so difficult to draw the diagram that we failed to get it in the report because we couldn't agree on what it should look like during the writing of the report, but we did do it afterwards. I'm going to show you it. I don't expect you to read everything that's on it. It looks a bit like the Pompidou Centre in Paris. It looks like this. So this is, this is our attempt to bring together all the, the pollinator issue and what we should do about it. And what you basically see on here is the, the, the drivers of pollinator decline in the middle, many different interacting drivers, land use change, climate change, pesticides, pollinator management and invasive species. And these cause risks to human well-being, like decline in resilience of food production, for instance, or crop pollination deficit. And on the other side, you have responses. These are the, some of the things you can do about looking after pollinators. And what you're trying to do is go from taking a response, so you change the way you manage land, or you reduce the use of pesticides, and this affects the driver. It reduces the driver, and this leads to an effect on, uh, which lowers the risk to humanity of loss of pollinators. But we made different types of arrows. So the, the thick arrows are where we thought there was clear evidence of a link between the response and the driver. And if the arrow is thin, we thought there's, there's, some, there's some evidence that, makes us, that, that infers that this is going on, but we don't have clear empirical evidence that it's actually happening. So for me, what the diagram shows, knowing the difference between the thick and the, the thin arrows, is that the best way to get across to many different, to reduce many different risks on this side is to go through land management change because this is linked with these thick arrows to all these different things and that's why I think we need to focus on land management. When we did the diagram the link between pesticides and loss of pollinator diversity was there was only enough evidence for us to agree as a group of scientists on having a thin arrow there. Now I think a year and a half later if it was just me and my opinion there's been some more evidence which I'm not going to take you through but I can talk about in questions if you're interested. I think there would be a thick arrow, but I would stress that that's just my single opinion as one scientist, and it's not in any way the scientific consensus for, for, for me speaking here tonight. So agriculture is part of the problem for pollinators, but it's also a key part of the solution. If you walk around in British agricultural land in the spring, this kind of habitat is the best you can find for queen bumblebees, because it's lots of long grass and nesting and hibernating area, and this is a willow tree which is full of nectar, so if you walk through this, you find all these queen bumblebees. That's where they're hanging out. But of course, this isn't very good for food production, and farmers are in the business of producing good quality food. This is fallow land. This is not actually making anyone any money. It's just looking after bees. So there's a balance in farming. You need to have some space for bees and other pollinators, but also you need to produce food. And there are a number of things that you can do that will sort of fit within this balance and help sustain pollination services on farms supported by quite a lot of evidence. So things like managing your hedgerows so they flower, leaving land fallow like this, patches of habitat, flowery field margins, and reducing pesticide use, either completely stopping pesticide and fertilizer use, like organic farming, or taking steps to do integrated pest management, which means you don't just spray chemicals, you try other things. You manage your landscape differently first, and you try and only spray when pests are arriving. You measure them coming in. So all of these things, if you do them together, will lead to both good quality food and better landscapes for all pollinators. You could have a similar set of actions if you were thinking about urban environments. Similar kind of things. Change the way we manage, increase the number of flowers, reduce the, the threats and the stresses on pollinators, and you'll have good outcomes. There's also lots of knowledge around the world. This is almost my last slide. And this, comes, this is a map of all the locations around the world when we did the global assessment report where there was evidence of practices that would support pollinators from local and indigenous knowledge. Things like practices to protect particularly important trees that, that happen to provide for, for bees to nest in, for instance. So there's a lot of knowledge beyond the science about how to look after pollinators, and we need to take account of that. I did publish a, a lead, a paper, after the assessment report about pollinators, which laid out these 10 poll pollinator policies and I'm pleased to say that some of these are now being taken up and, and looked at by governments. There's actually a, 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 an organisation called the Coalition of the Willing, which now has 19 countries have signed a declaration that says they either are have it, already have or are going to implement national pollinator strategies 
including, I'm pleased to say, all four of the UK countries now have national pollinator strategies. So there's a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of um, policy makers really keen to do something about pollinators, which is why we're at such a good point in time right now. So to sum everything up, I'd just like to, to bring it all together by saying the key messages from tonight, there, there is a global loss of pollinators. Some highly valued foods and drinks and ecosystems are at risk. And the solution is to transform agricultural landscapes to support wild pollinators. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Um, so we'd now like to open up for questions from the audience. So if you raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you so we can hear the question um, clearly all around the room. Okay, so if we take one, one on the end there. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I've got a question regarding the corridors that we've heard a lot about in, in the media, uh, corridors of wild planting. Um, do you think the lack of the corridors are actually resulting in inbreeding within the uh, pollinator, pollinator communities and therefore uh, loss, of, loss of these pollinators because of their inability to cross between different uh, colonies of the same species? No. <laughs> <laughs> I will explain. Uh, so I, th 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 it's interesting with, with uh, corridors. The idea of putting corridors, I think there's, there's a, a, a bug life campaign to have bee lines, for instance, which is, which is allocating lines to restore flowers in. The main point of doing that, from my perspective, as an ecologist of bees particularly, is to increase the number of flowers. What matters is the, the amount of flowers at, at a particular scale that bees are foraging on. And bees will be, they're foraging, the average foraging range for the bigger bumblebees is about 500 metres, so they're operating in a, in a, a diameter of a kilometre and they just need there to be enough flowers. It doesn't, because they fly and they're quite mobile, it doesn't actually matter so much where the flowers are as long as they can reach them and they're not too far apart. So the idea that they're, 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 stopping, they're being stopped from moving around by a lack of corridors isn't, for me, it's not supported by evidence, but it's a really good idea to use it as an idea that gets everyone planting flowers. So I'm quite happy that with, with that as a, <laughs> if it galvanizes people to take effort, that's wonderful. I think for others, for, so one thing to say about corridors is that there is quite good evidence that they inc increase the movement of insects through landscapes. Butterflies, particularly, and other animals will move along corridors, and there's quite good evidence to show that. And therefore, it, if you have plants that require pollination and they're in isolated patches of habitat and you put a corridor between them, it helps the plants to be pollinated. And there's, there, is stu there are studies showing that. It doesn't so much help the pollinators, but it helps the plants. Yeah, there's a question at the front here. went up very quickly. <laughs> Isn't it the case that where neonics are used, that the fact that a large amount of chemical is not taken up by the plant means that uh, flower margins are becoming very dangerous as well? And is it also the case that there is shortly going to be a vote by the EU on use of neonics? Yes. It, it, so the, the, the neonicotinoids are these systemic insecticides which have been used for a long time. For those who don't know about them, I, I, I expect most of you do. <laughs> They, they were a, a, a really positive thing when they first came out for farmers because you didn't have to spray. You could just coat the seed and then the insecticide is inside the plant. And then gradually we realised that if you have insecticide inside the plant, the insecticide is also in the nectar and it's in the pollen and therefore it's harvested by bees and it's taken back to their colonies to feed their young. So there's a really serious problem and the, we, we have had a moratorium on some neonicotinoids in Europe for quite a few years now and I believe there is a, a forthcoming vote. I don't know exactly when it's taking place but I think it's very soon, tomorrow. <laughs> okay. um, and I also know that the European Food Safety Authority has re-published a recent risk assessment which, show, which, which says that there, there is unacceptable harm to bees from these things so I think it's quite likely that we'll, we'll vote to not have the neonicotinoids anymore. But I would say that although we've managed to regulate out for now some neonicotinoids, there are new systemic insecticides coming along the regulatory process called sulfoxamines, which have a similar mechanism, but they're not regulated in this. I mean, and hopefully we've changed, the, the, there's enough of a change in the regulatory process for us to be taking into account now the sublethal effects on bees in the, in a, it, with exposure in the wider environment when those ones come through, because they will. <laughs> so I don't think we've solved it. And, and I would also say with neonicotinoids, if you take out one type of insecticide and you don't 
really try and address the way that farming is dependent on the use of pesticides, they just get replaced with other pesticides. Or we revert back to previous pesticides because we have crop varieties and systems of farming that are very heavily reliant on chemical, chemicals that kill insects and kill weeds. And that needs to be changed, but it's a, quite a fundamental change in the, the way that we farm that's required, as well as good pesticide regulation. You're right about the wildflower margins as well. There is some evidence, and nothing like enough in my view. There's just a couple of studies showing that wildflowers planted on the edge of crop fields have neonicotinoids in them, sometimes at the same level as they are in the crops, because it's presumably it's the, it, the, 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 the chemicals are coming through the soil and they're systemic, so they get taken up by the wildflowers. This is quite a serious issue if farmers are being encouraged to plant wildflowers in margins alongside crops, especially if the, the wildflower margins are being targeted to places where the soil is in, where the, the land is infertile, which is often the places at the bottom of the slope where the water will gather. So there's, there's a real issue there. I'm glad you raised it, and I think we need a lot more research on that to find out what's really going on. Okay, any other questions? Here, should we go up towards the back? Yes. Sorry, Marisa. <laughs> <laughs> we can have some fun. <laughs> Off and up and down. Um, I've heard in certain parts of the world, I think specifically California, they transport bees in large trucks to pollinate. What are the pros and cons of doing that? Okay, so that's true. They, they, there is a lot of transporting of honeybees on large trucks, large numbers of colonies, and that has been implicated in the, in the rapid decline of numbers of managed colonies in honeybees in the States. I would say I, it's not my area of expertise, so I don't know a huge amount about honeybee health, but I believe that there's, a, a, there's evidence that, that honeybees are stressed to some extent by the movement. There are serious problems with honeybee health in most places in the world, actually, because one, one of the big problems is that we have this varroa mite which came across from the eastern honeybee and has now spread into almost everywhere in the world and is in, very, very common. In fact, you hardly ever see a honeybee hive here without varroa mite. The mite itself is an external mite, but it carries viruses. And so there's an, there's an apparent increase in a number of viruses, but particularly deformed wing virus, which spreads across to wild pollinators. So there's lots of issues about honeybee management. And one of them is transporting, and I think there's a, a, there is a stressful impact on the bees, but I don't know any more about it than that, I'm afraid. Okay, should we take another question from the back while Maurice is up yep. there, and then we'll come back down to the front? Well, I thought we were going to bring her all the way down to the front. <laughs> <and back up. laughs> Thank you. Um, is there anything that us amateur gardeners can do to help in all this, or should we be um, putting our energies into lobbying, farming practices? Uh, there's absolutely lots of things that amateur gardeners can do, so thank you for that question. Um, I would pick on two particular things. One is gardens are, are actually really important for, bee, for wild bees and other pollinators. And in fact, the communities of wild bees in cities can be as diverse as they are in the countryside, if not more so. And there's even evidence that wild bees are healthier in cities than they are in the countryside from the States. They have a lower incidence of, of particular pathogens, which is possibly because they have more varied diets. So gardens are really important for bees, populations, and health. So what, one thing you can do as a gardener is choose to plant flowers that actually provide resources for bees. And that means not choosing the double-petaled varieties that don't have any anthers, that don't produce any pollen. A lot of flowers have been bred by, by horticulturists and gardeners to, to replace the, the, the fertile parts of the flower with petals so that they, they're double-petaled or triple-petaled and they just look beautiful, lots of petals. They, they don't have resources. They sometimes don't have pollen, they don't have much nectar. So you can choose varieties that have pollen and nectar. And I'm pleased to see that there, there are now a lot, there are quite a few labelling schemes telling you in garden centres which flowers have good nectar and pollen for bees and which don't. And the second thing is just think very carefully about whether or not you need to use insecticides and try and find out if the plants you're growing have systemic insecticides already treated on the seeds, because some do, quite a lot do, in fact. So try and avoid insecticides and, and garden organically. Okay, question at the front. Um, and for those of us who live in flats and don't own farms and control any landscape, is there anything we can do with what we consume in terms of uh, you know, different food types, is there anything we can encourage that way, or certifications? Or? So there, that's a great question. I would say yes, 
There isn't, a, the, I, as far as I know, there isn't a particular pollinator certification scheme at the moment. Please, if someone knows one, but let me know. Um, there is organic food, which is that there's some evidence that organic farms have more species of bee on them. It's not completely unequivocal, but it's, it's reasonably strong, and more species generally. So if you care about wildlife, it's a good idea to eat organic food. Obviously, it's more expensive, and that's part of the trade-off. Um, so that, that's something I would advise. And also, raising awareness, noticing the bees around you and the other insects around you, and telling other people about pollinators and why they matter. You know, when you, when you, now that you know which crops are pollinator dependent, you can just talk to people about it. When you're having your strawberries and cream in the summer, oh, these, these depend on bees, and the bees will be there, you can look at them. <laughs> And the, the same bees that do the pollination. So just raising awareness and that is really important part of all of this, especially about the wider diversity of, of bees and other pollinators. I should say as well that the, because we have a national pollinator strategy in, in England, one of its main strands has been to do a public information campaign which is called Bees Needs and there's a really nice Bees Needs website and there's a, a, a simple set of five actions that you can take. So if you, if you put Bees Needs or hashtag Bees Needs into, into Google or your favourite search engine, you can find a lot of information, and there's, there's even a Bees Needs Week in July coming up. So there's quite a lot of public awareness going on. Have we got time for one more question? Yes, yes. yes. I'd like to also add that uh, people can get the uh, bee hotels, or I don't know what they're called in this country, but have mason bees, that's a snap. Just put it on your wall, and they will come. I want to, um, I'm glad you mentioned the urban beekeeping. Um, I've heard anecdotally, um, from other beekeepers that the urban hives do very well production-wise, honey production-wise, but don't seem to survive the winter as well as the rural bees. Um, do you know anything about that or could speculate why that might be? Or, and also, how are the other pollinators doing in urban environments? Okay, thanks for that. Um, I, I don't know anything about the relative health of urban versus rural honeybee hives, I'm afraid. I know that wild pollinators are doing okay in cities, as I said before. There is a slight issue with urban beekeeping in, the, in that it increases the density of bees, and, and honeybees are quite large in numbers when you have a hive, and they do actually compete a little bit with wild pollinators. I, I think mostly it's okay, but if, if, you, if you introduce a lot of honeybee hives into an area where resources are short, that might not be such a good thing. I think in urban areas, it's, there's probably quite enough resource so it's a reasonably good thing to, to do, but I'm not entirely sure. On the bee hotels, though, can I just pick up that point? Because there's, there's really good evidence that bee hotels are, are good for solitary bees. Only the cavity nesting species. There are lots of ground nesting species that wouldn't use those bee hotels, but there are some species that very frequently do, so they, they get used, and if you put them in the same place repeatedly over time, you get increased numbers of females and increased populations in, in your local area, so they really work, as opposed to nest boxes for bumblebees, which don't get used by bumblebees, so don't spend £25 on one of those. <laughs> save, save some money. <laughs> okay, so what, one last question then. Is um, right back there? Just two, two rows back. I can't see up there. Sorry, I no, can't see who's yes. speaking. During your lecture, you have identified a number of contributory factors um, because of which you think that... Um, pollinators have been on the decline for the past few years. Would you be able to expand on the scientific evidence because of which you have drawn the conclusion that fertilizers and pesticides play an important role? I, I can't, how much time do we have? Oh, <laughs> one, one minute. <laughs> one minute. Um, so so fertilizers are, are tied up with the loss of flower rich meadows. So for instance, in the UK we lost 97% of our flower rich meadows between about 1950 and 1988, I think. And that was largely because we fertilized them and made them into productive single species grasslands and the flowers disappear. So that's, that's the reason for putting fertilizers there. If you fertilize grasslands, you lose the flowering species in them. On pesticides, there is a lot of evidence now that particular pesticides have adverse effects on bee health and bee survival, but that's hardly surprising because they're designed to kill insects. So we shouldn't be surprised. But there, is now, there are now two really good replicated landscape scale studies comparing the reproductive success of bumblebees and solitary bees in landscapes with and without particular pesticides, in this case neonicotinoids. There's a study from Sweden, there's a multi-country study from the UK and Germany and Hungary. 
And they both found a relationship, the, the Swedish study found a really unacceptable level of impact on, wild, on bumblebee colonies, an 80% drop in queen production in the treated landscape, compared to a landscape where other pesticides were used, but just not the systemic neonicotinoid. So that was a really strong result, but it was only one study. The second study on neonicotinoids found, which was Woodcock et al., it's a, a lead in Britain, didn't find the strong effect of the different landscapes, but it did show a, a, a significant relationship between the exposure of bumblebees to neonicotinoids and their reproductive success and colony growth. So there, there was a strong effect. And what, what all of the, both of the studies found is that wherever you put the bumblebees in landscape with or without neonicotinoid treatment, they are exposed to it because it's in the environment. So it's quite difficult to draw apart. But both of those studies taken together lead me to conclude that there's enough evidence that they're having a serious, they could be having a serious impact on bee health in the wider environment. And so we should probably regulate them out. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you, Lynn. I think that was an absolutely fantastic talk. I certainly learnt a lot, and we'll be taking a lot of it back. So thank you for sharing your scientific knowledge, but not only that, but your passion for your topic as well. Pleasure. So if you join me all in saying thank you to Lynn.